Uh, next speaker is uh, Fatma Kirin Karsan, and she's going to talk about conic mixed binary sets. Well, thank you, Yuri. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for um, organizing this wonderful event and putting so much effort in it, and also inviting me to give a talk. Uh, today, I will talk about uh, my joint work with uh, great collaborators, Simje Kütükyavuz and the Bin Lee. And this is going to be about conic mixed binary sets. We will talk about some convex cell characterizations and applications. And as Jan indicated, we are moving in the right direction. We will have a bunch of binary variables in this talk. Um, so, sorry. So, uh, in this talk, I will mainly focus on this set S. And in this set, we have X and Z variables, X are continuous variables, these are binaries. And in addition, this set is like a lifted set. It's, I'm looking at the projection of another set. And uh, this lifting is given by this Y variable, which is continuous. And it's sort of modeling the epigraph of this function F. And in addition, we have this conic constraint. So we have the constraint AX plus BY in a cone K. Uh, we will be making a bunch of assumptions. Uh, in particular, we will assume that this f function acting on binary variables is a non-negative function. And we will also assume that this k is a convex cone containing the origin. Okay, and you can imagine k to be a polyhedral cone. You can imagine it to be second order cone or semi-definite cone. Any convex cone containing the origin will work. And a and b then will be matrices of appropriate dimension. So uh, why do we care about this particular set? Um, we have noticed that this set appears in wide range of applications, especially when K is taken as second order cone. And in particular, it pops up in mean risk optimization, fractional binary optimization, and so forth. And in particular, we have seen a very recent line of work showing that looking at this set and exploiting in particular submodular structure on function F leads to great computational results. So I've listed a number of papers. Uh, I'm sure I had forgotten some, but all of these papers in West, uh, vastly different applications uh, show that a set of this form pops up. And when you exploit a submodular structure related to function F, you get great computational results. So we wanted to look deeper into this set. We wanted to understand what's the properties of this set. Can we give the convex cell? Are all these results essentially exploiting the same structure? So um, to this end, these are our questions. We want to see, given such a set S, can we exploit the structure of F effectively? Note that I have not yet made F to be a submodular function as an assumption, but we will see that will come up. And then we want to know if there's a systematic way to give the convex cell of this set S, or if whenever we cannot give the convex cell, can we uh, give a great way of uh, generating relative inequalities, a very structured way of generating relative inequalities for it. So uh, let me give an outline of today's talk. Uh, at the beginning, I will talk about uh, this set S, and I will simply say that, in fact, the most uh, trivial thing that you would like to do will suffice, in particular, if you are able to give the convex cell of this function, uh, epigraph of this function F, then it will suffice to give the convex cell of this set S, so the conic constraint in, in particular is causing no harm. And then we will see that you can generalize this result to multiple functions F and multiple conic constraints. Um, and then I'll come back and relate this set S with the set overline S, this bar S. And the main difference between S and bar S is that uh, bar S doesn't have this epigraph variable Y. So it's directly working in the X and Z space and the function F is embedded in the conic constraint directly. And in fact, uh, in many of these applications, the set that you see will be this bar S set. And uh, therefore, we want to have an understanding of what's the relation between S and bar S set. And we will see that uh, if the data interact nicely with the cone K, then this equivalence holds immediately. And then uh, we will see, uh, or we will have a discussion about when can we easily characterize the convex cell of epigraph of F, because that turns out to be the critical uh, requirement for our convex cell characterizations. And this is the case when f is a non-negative submodular function. This is given by Loash's work or Alper and Mishnu's recent work. And then uh, even more recently, there is a generalization of uh, that concept 
of uh, polymetroid inequalities, the arbitrary set functions. Um, so I will mention briefly uh, Alper and Vishnu's most recent work as well. And finally, we will talk about some applications. I selected these ones. I hope we will have enough time to go over them. Okay, so let's start. Uh, this is our set S. It has this epigraph variable, and uh, these are our assumptions. So the immediate convex relaxation for this set is obtained uh, when you take the convex sum of the epigraph of F, because these are binaries, and if you just focus on that part alone, this is going to be a convex relaxation. We will denote this with S hat set. And um, we will see that when you make this assumption, these assumptions, uh, F being a non-negative function, K being a convex con containing origin, then just convexifying the epigraph of F will be sufficient to get the convex hull of this set S. So the conic constraints are not harming at all. And uh, in fact, uh, we can generalize this result to multiple uh, functions and multiple conic constraints. In this setup, this set S uh, right now will have uh, it will have multiple functions acting on the common binary variables, C, but each have their own epigraph variable, yj's, and uh, the conic constraints are separable in the sense that the xj's, the continuous variables taking part in the conic constraints, do not interact with each other. When we have this type of structure, again, um, the immediate convex relaxation of this set will be given by looking at uh, now the convex sum of the intersection of the epigraphs. So I have this G set. Uh, it has the common Z binary variables, and it has the epigraph variables for each YJ. And we are talking about convexifying this G set and building our convex relaxation for the S set based on that convexification. And uh, in fact, when you do this, uh, you will get the convex sum of this S set again. Um, for like, here is a slight uh, proof outline. What we do is we look at what happens in the lifted space. So in the lifted space, now we have the X, Y, and Z variables together. And um, we have the same structure. Um, in this case, I'm not, I, I'm assuming G to be a general set satisfying a certain property. In particular, I'm assuming G to be the subset of non-negative orthant uh, times the binary vector, such that uh, when I restrict G to a particular, uh, when I restrict the Z variables in G to a particular binary uh, vector, then the remaining part of G must be convex. So it's sort of saying that if I look at the face of G obtained in this fashion, then it must be a convex face. Um, and when these assumptions are satisfied, then we can prove that the convex hull of this Q set in the lifted space is given exactly by taking the convex hull of the G set. So the conic constraints, uh, again, uh, don't uh, harm the convex hull. And um, because of this, now we can come back to our set S. And our set S is indeed uh, exactly the projection of the Q set defined for a particular G. And this G is exactly our epigraph, uh, intersection of epigraph set. And uh, based on this, again, uh, this when we define the G in this form, we see that G satisfies the assumptions that we need, in particular, it's subset of the non-negative orthant uh, direct product of the binary vectors. And uh, this is because FJs are non-negative functions. And again, if you look at the face of G obtained by setting the Z variables to some binary value, it will be a convex space. Um, now, using this proposition and the fact that convex hull and projection operations commute, uh, we end up with our results saying that if you look at the convex set S defined with multiple functions, non-negative functions, and multiple conic constraints, then its convex hull is given by S set set, which is obtained by simply convexifying this G set over here. So um, I want to give a summary of what, what we have talked so far in the case where we have a single uh, function. So we already talked about this set S, which is in the middle. It is our epigraph variable. We have seen that uh, under our assumptions, this set S hat gives its convex hull. And in the convex hull, we are simply convexifying the epigraph of the function F. 
I want to also talk about the top set, which is this S bar set. And this is the set where we don't have the epigraph variable. Uh, we are simply embedding our function directly into the constraint. And this is the form that uh, appears mostly in the applications. So we wanted to understand when is it true that uh, the S bar set is equal to S set? Okay, when can we really do this epigraph lifting? And uh, to that account, uh, we know that S bar set is always contained in the S set. And therefore, convex all of S bar set is always uh, contained in convex all of S, and therefore the S hat set. Uh, we also know that um, because of the relation between these sets, if it turns out that our uh, assumptions are satisfied, like f is a non-negative function and k is a cone containing version, and in addition, if it turns out that uh, the S bar set is exactly equal to the S set, then we can say convex hull of the S bar set is exactly given by the S set set. Okay, so uh, in a way, we know this is exactly what we need if we want to give the convex hull of S bar set. Okay, so uh, because of that, uh, we want to understand when S bar set is exactly equal to S set. And uh, we identified a necessary and sufficient condition for this. So this condition simply works with the conic constraint, and it says that if your conic constraint and data is such that if you're able to scale your X part uh, with any scalar post, uh, greater than or equal to one, and if the remaining constraint remains valid for your set, then you can actually do this uh, equivalence. You can say that S bar is equal to S set exactly. You, you will be able to do this lifting with the epigraph variable. And uh, sometimes it's not trivial to check this condition. Therefore, we developed another sufficient condition. And this sufficient condition says that if the con K and data AB are interacting such that um, you have this relation, so you have the relation that any XC satisfying AX plus BFC in K, you also have AX in K, then uh, your, the condition star is satisfied. So um, it may look a little difficult to check this condition, but we will see that in all of the applications considered in the literature, this condition uh, bullet is satisfied all the time. So uh, this is a summary of what happens uh, with the S bar set. If you have multiple uh, constraints, multiple functions and constraints, notation is um, terrifying here, but uh, the bottom line is uh, it's saying that there's a generalization of our condition that ensures that S bar set is equal to S set. And uh, because of uh, under, under that condition and under our assumptions that if uh, the functions are non-negative and the cons are convex containing the origin, then you will have the convex all description of the S bar set exactly in the way that we obtain S hat set. So uh, let's come back to how can we obtain the convex all of the epigraph of sets or epigraphs, uh, intersections of epigraphs of uh, functions. So uh, here, I have a set function, and uh, you can imagine these things as a set function, or you can imagine these things as functions acting on binary variables. Um, I can also use this function. Uh, I can say that this function f v is exactly equal to f of the characteristic vector of v. And uh, for these set functions, there is something called associated polyhedron of the function f. And this is the set of vectors pi, such that uh, if you sum the pi i values over the set uh, i in v, uh, you want these values to be less than or equal to the function value evaluated at uh, set v. And uh, you want this for all uh, possible subsets v of uh, n. Okay, so uh, this set uh, pf is indeed uh, given by exponentially many inequalities. And uh, this set is, uh, at least this name uh, was introduced uh, in uh, Alper and Vishnu's recent work. And moreover, what we know about this set through polarity is that uh, if we take any vector pi from this set, uh, we are doing a little shifting because we want to work with non-negative functions. So uh, this f minus f empty is doing that shifting to obtain a non-negative function. Uh, if we take any vector pi from this set, then the polar inequalities generated uh, by the vector pi, and these are the inequalities uh, given by greater than equal to pi transpose z plus f empty set. 
Uh, these inequalities are always valid for the convex hull of the epigraph. So these are telling us a way to generate valid inequalities for convex hull of the epigraph. And also these inequalities are facet defining whenever pi is an extreme point of this associated polyhedron PF. So uh, this is giving us a way to generate valid inequalities for convex hull of the epigraph of F, and therefore this is giving us a way to generate valid inequalities for our set S or S bar. Um, now, um, these inequalities may look familiar to you if, if you are familiar with submodular functions. And let me do a very brief uh, overview of submodular functions. A function is submodular if and only if it satisfies this relation. So the function evaluated at u plus evaluated at v should be greater than or equal to the function evaluated at u union v plus the function evaluated at u intersection v. So submodular functions in general model diminishing marginal return or this economy of scale, and they pop up everywhere naturally. For example, cut functions in graphs, entropy, metroid, value address, machine learning applications, uh, they are very common. Uh, I want to give you a couple of forms of submodular functions. So if you take some binary arrivals C, uh, and if you look at a function, the utility function, for example, uh, where G is a concave function and C is a non-negative vector, then this composition G of C transpose X is indeed a submodular function. And in many of the applications uh, that we will see, submodular functions will have either this form, the utility function form, or max function form pops up in uh, joint chance constraints, for example, uh, the constant elasticity of substitution, this form pops up in distributionally robust optimization, so the list goes on. Um, but uh, one common thing is they are uh, very common in applications. Now, when we look at submodular function and when we look at this associated polyhedron defined based on the submodular function, we will see that this is nothing but the extended polymetroid of the function f. And then uh, we will also observe that the polar inequalities are indeed precisely the polymetroid inequalities of f. And in the case of submodular functions, uh, Loash has a characterization saying that if the function is submodular, then the convex hull of epigraph of F is exactly given by these polymetroid inequalities. Okay? So everything is lined up very nicely with submodular functions. This simply says that if you want to obtain the convex hull of epigraph of F, all you need to do is separate uh, these polymetroid inequalities. Well, there is even one more good news. Uh, in fact, the separation of the polymetroid inequalities is easy as well. You can separate them in n log n time. And this is by Edmund's uh, famous algorithm for the characterization of extreme points of uh, extended polymetroids. Okay, so everything is lined up very nicely. If you have submodular functions, you are able to obtain convex hull of epi epigraph of F easily. And once you obtain that, you are able to obtain uh, the convex hull of the set S easily. So, um, well, this is a summary then. If you have uh, your set S, and if it happens that the function that you are dealing with, this F is submodular, non-negative submodular function, um, and your cone K is a convex cone containing the origin, then the convex hull of this set S is given exactly by the polymetroid inequalities that can be separated in n log n time. So that's wonderful. Then you can ask what happens if I have multiple constraints? And things uh, align very well in the case of multiple constraints and submodular functions as well. So we were interested in uh, convexifying this set. And this is a set of intersection of epigraph, uh, epigraphs of multiple submodular functions acting on the same set of variables, Z. And this intersection, this uh, convex hull is given exactly by the intersections of the convex hulls of individual uh, epigraphs of these functions. So all you will have to do is separate the corresponding um, polymetroid inequalities for each function fj. Okay. Uh, and this was first observed by Bauman et al. And we recently ran into the same set when we were looking at uh, joint chance constraints. And we have a slight extension of that result too. So if I put everything together, if you have a set S, and if this set S uh, has multiple submodular, not negative submodular functions and conic constraints, then you can obtain the convex hull of this set S through S hat set 
where all you have to do is convexify the epigraph of individual submodular function, which you can do with polymetroid inequalities. So uh, I want to give you a couple of extensions of our framework. Um, first, um, this is our basic setup. Uh, we wanted to understand what happens if you add some natural uh, constraints. In particular, if you're adding additional conic constraints on continuous variables, these are uh, not that these are separable in terms of the X-ray variables, then the convex hull result holds naturally. Um, if you want to add non-homogeneous conic constraints, things get tricky. So these are constraints of the form AJ, XJ plus BJ, YJ plus CJ, where CJ is uh, now non-zero. Uh, if you add this, you can turn this into a conic constraint by introducing a single variable. So you can make this as plus CJ times VJ in con K and then VJ equals to one. But the transformation, in fact, does not preserve the convex hull result. Uh, so you'll end up with a convex relaxation indeed, but not a convex hull. And we have an example showing this. Uh, however, uh, in various applications, you may still want to use such a con structured convex hull. Uh, if you are dealing with general set functions, which are neither uh, non-negative or non-positive, again, you can do a very simple transformation. You can uh, define your function f to be uh, h minus the minimum value of h. Uh, again, in such a case, once you do this transformation, unfortunately, you'll end up with uh, a non-homogeneous conic constraint uh, structure. Therefore, you will only get a relaxation. Or if you have non-negative supermodular functions h, again, you can do a transformation. You can look at uh, minus h plus the maximum of h, which you can efficiently compute. But again, in this case, uh, you will end up with a non-homogeneous conic constraint. Therefore, you will only get a relaxation. Atma, we are uh, two minutes away from the 25 okay. minutes. Wonderful. Thank you, Yuri. So um, we looked at a number of applications and to try to understand uh, how this structure pops up and uh, what we can say using our techniques. And in particular, we looked at this S-bar structure. And this structure pops up in various forms. Uh, I want to discuss only three problems here. Um, if you are minimizing a fun an objective function of this form, square root of a function f plus uh, some squared norm uh, term, and this structure pops up in mean risk optimization, where f then will be submodular. Or if you have an objective which is a ratio of, again, a squared Euclidean norm over uh, a function f, uh, then you'll end up with this s bar structure. Uh, and the application that I'll talk about uh, will come from best subset selection problem. And in that case, f will be a square modular function. So there are other structures uh, where this uh, S-bar set pops up uh, with p-order cons, for example, uh, in distributionally robust optimization. Uh, I will refer you to the paper if you want to learn more about those. So let's look at the first structure. This is our S-bar set. And uh, in particular, Alpar and Andres examined two fundamental sets that were appearing in many applications. Uh, I'm just giving you the structure of these sets. Uh, this H set and R set, uh, I want to focus on one of them. Uh, let's say we are looking at the H set. So uh, by defining this function FC, which is the square root of uh, this term sigma plus uh, CJ, CI, ZI sum, then uh, we will observe that this F function is indeed a submodular function because it's concave. And uh, what's inside is always non-negative. So this is a non-negative submodular function. And in fact, now using this f uh, function, uh, we can rewrite this h set. Um, and this is going to be simply this uh, rewritten. And then we can, in fact, observe that this is nothing but a second order con constraint where the f function is embedded uh, directly in that set, in that structure. And in fact, you can easily check that uh, our sufficient condition for exactness of S bar and S sets uh, are immediately satisfied here. Therefore, we can immediately say that the convex hull of this H set is given by our S set set, which was exactly identified in Alper and Andreas's work, but using very different uh, techniques. Um, and they also reported excellent computational results for this setup. Um, let's look at another example coming from mixed uh, fractional binary programming. 
and here we are minimizing a ratio, a sum of the ratios, and these are binary variables, and all the data here are non-negative. So uh, this structure appears a lot uh, in particular modeling multinomial logic choice uh, problem choice models in assortment optimization. Uh, for this structure, uh, you can define for each term in the summon, you can define a new variable UL and rewrite uh, the corresponding constraint in this form. And uh, once you, you do this transformation, you end up with a problem of this structure. Now, the critical thing or the interesting thing for us was uh, in this form, you are actually looking at intersections of the sets. Uh, all of these constraints can be written as second order con constraints. And you are looking at intersection of these constraints together, they're acting on the same Z variables. Therefore, again, uh, you can observe a submodular structure. And uh, by looking at a result on submodular functions, you can give the convex all of this substructure. However, you have more, uh, you have these additional linear constraints. So this will only give you a relaxation. And finally, uh, if you look at sparse, um, best subset selection problem, we are trying to find sparse subset of regressors beta that best fits the data. And uh, Andres and Oleg studied a model of this form. Uh, so this is a little unusual because now we are talking about another additional function g. In uh, most common models, you will only look for some other criteria for sparsity. Uh, we have the z variables that are binary and they're controlling their on-off variables controlling the regressors beta i. And uh, in their model, they looked at uh, the G function to be a non-increasing convex function. And this was motivated by uh, uh, enabling us to consider several criteria for goodness of fit considered in this literature, for example, mean squared error uh, or any one of these. Uh, they are considering these G functions that are defined by exponentials. But uh, if you look at uh, these G functions, you will observe that all of these are um, submodular functions. Um, I'm sorry, all of these are supermodular functions. And uh, in their work, they consider this problem and develop a technique. They parameterize the fraction and apply customs, customized Newton type method. But in fact, uh, you can define this H function uh, based on the G function. You will observe that H is non-negative and supermodular. And uh, then you will observe that you can rewrite this objective by using an epigraph variable. And this form doesn't look maybe exactly a second order con constraint, but it's very easy to transform this into a second order con constraint. And then uh, using our techniques, you can give a, um, a convex relaxation for this problem that you can opt, uh, immediately embed in a branch and cut framework given by a solver. So to summarize, uh, in this talk, we have seen uh, convex cell characterizations of sets defined by submodular functions and conic constraints. And this offers a convenient framework for com developing convex relaxations, exploring, exploiting function structure, even if the function is not submodular. Uh, there's a wide variety of extensions you can uh, cover with this framework. You can uh, address or develop or have a way of using submodularity uh, in a variety of applications. And then um, I want to conclude saying that mixed integer extensions of polymetroid inequalities are very useful in many practical applications. And uh, there is a very structured way of using them right now. So try to find submodularity and use submodularity wherever you see it. I guess this was a suggestion made earlier by IPAR, but I want to repeat it again. So um, if you want to know more, uh, these are the papers. You may have more information, look at more applications. And I'd like to thank you again for being patient with me when I go over time. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Fatma. So uh, there is maybe time for one very quick question, if there is anything. Otherwise, we postpone everything to Slack. So um, there's a question by Akshay. Besides submodularity, are there other functions whose epigraph can be convexified over zero one? Um, well, thank you, Akshay. That's a great question. Um, I think there are some, well, you can look at special cases. There will be some special cases, like if you have one variable, one binary variable or two binary variables, things like that. Uh, 
Um, other than that, uh, the results coming from mixing step, like if you have a uh, separable, like if you are looking at the epigraph of a piecewise linear convex function and uh, your x variables are binary, then again, uh, you can get the convex all of that epigraph. Uh, 